So as long as it's fair, as long as it's voluntary, inequality is fine. Inequality is great. We want those who succeed to be more rewarded than those who destroy value. But in the sense of our current environment, we have really sinister inequality. If everybody, you know, if, if the water's flowing and everyone is benefiting, right, everyone's cup is filled, um, people are happy, right? They have better things to do than to line up outside of someone's house and threaten to chop their head off. You know, I, I don't think we should be setting up guillotines anywhere. And that's, that's why I love Bitcoin. It's the peaceful revolution, right? Um, but why do people want to set up these guillotines? Because they know the system isn't working. It started to make a lot of sense to me that if we fixed money, we fixed so many problems in society. And so as a technology person, I was like, what should I be working on that's more important than this? this is, there's nothing more important than this. Hello and welcome to the Tucson Bitcoin Podcast. Today I have on Jimmy Song, who is just an absolute legend in Bitcoin. He is a prolific Twitter poster, and he is the author of Programming Bitcoin, which is a great starting point if you want to check out how to program Bitcoin. Pretty self-explanatory in the title. Uh, he's just a really, really well-rounded, smart guy, and we had a great conversation. Uh, some of the questions I posed to him in this interview were questions that I was asked uh, when I had been invited to speak at a Loyola University class on uh, banking uh, about Bitcoin and uh, he did a great job of answering these questions and it was a really fun interview. I hope you enjoy. And we're recording. Welcome to the podcast, Jimmy. Uh, thanks for having me. I think we're both a little frazzled because of my disorganization, but uh, so sorry about that, but it's really good to have you. Um, so for anybody listening, Jimmy Song is a very influential person in the world of Bitcoin. He's a Bitcoin educator, wrote this awesome book. Um, if you want to get into programming Bitcoin uh, called Programming Bitcoin, um, and you have great posts on Twitter, so definitely go and follow him. Um, but yeah, how, how did you get into Bitcoin, first and uh, foremost? Well, I'm, I'm a programmer, so I read a lot of tech websites. And back in 2011, I was reading an article on Slashdot, and it said uh, Bitcoin has broken $1. And I didn't even know what like what that meant, because I, I couldn't parse that sentence. And, uh, and when I read into it and looked into it. I was, I, I was absolutely blown away. I was like, okay, 21 million. I immediately knew that even, even without knowing the technical details, it was pretty much if it's, uh, if this thing catches on, I better have some of it early rather than late. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been a wild ride since then, but yeah, it, it was mostly because I was a programmer and I happened to be on the right websites and, uh, learned about it. Um, of course, I know people that got in even earlier than I did, um, but you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah, it, it seems like there's a 2011 was a, a major point of adoption um, for some of the people that have been around a while. 2013 was, and then you get all the noobs like me um, coming in around like 2018. Um, <coughs> but yeah, yeah, you were in early. I mean, I think it's pretty shocking if. For people listening to think of to even imagine bitcoin at a dollar um <laughs> so yeah did you have to like go to mount gox or or something to to buy it or how, how did you how did it look back then yeah uh so initially i tried to mine it and i got nowhere because uh you know i was like okay how do i how do i get this tried to mine it like um, and I had a couple of AWS servers that I could use. Um, it took up all of the CPU and didn't produce anything. So I was like, let me just do the math here a little bit. And I figured out, okay, if there's even like a thousand people that are doing something similar, then there's no way that I can, I, I'm going to mine anything. Um, so I, uh, from that, I, surmise that I needed to go buy some. I looked for a way to buy some. I, I saw one PayPal, one guy that was selling it for PayPal money, but he, he had gotten, um, uh, you know, like 
I guess, uh, banned by PayPal or something uh, like three months earlier. Uh, and the only other way was Mt. Gox. And then I was like, okay, well, how do, how do I trade on Mt. Gox? And it turned out at that point in time, what you had to do was transfer money into a place called Dwala, uh, which would link to your bank account and then you get credit on Dwala. And then you would use your Dwala account to fund your Mt. Gox account, which was all the way in Japan. So everything took like uh, a few weeks to set up. And, uh, you know, one of my big regrets in life was, you know, I first heard about Bitcoin at a dollar and I, I learned about this. I was like, ah, it's too painful. Let's not do it right now. <laughs> and uh, of course, I came to regret that decision uh, significantly. But that, that, was, uh, that, was my, that was my exposure to it. Uh, eventually, like that summer, uh, Bitcoin went to $30. And that, that was considered a big bubble because it went from $1 to $30. Um, and then dropped back down to like, uh, you know, pre dropped pretty fast. Um, at that point, I was like, okay, I really need to get into this. Um, so I had started on Dwala, so it, it didn't take quite as long. And eventually, I was able to transfer money to, to Mt. Gox and buy some. Awesome. Yeah, that I probably couldn't have gotten into it then, even if I wanted to. Oh. I mean, there was yeah. always like uh, people selling it in person and so on, but I didn't know anybody that was into Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, I was just sort of like, okay, I, how do I get into this? And that's, uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people feel similarly if they don't have like a friend or relative that can sort of guide them through that process. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, in, in, you're talking about PayPal banning this guy and now they're, now they're, uh, starting to sort of adopt Bitcoin and eliminate. Well, they're letting you buy from them, right? Uh, so yeah. this guy was like, I guess, using his PayPal account to sell people Bitcoin. And uh, I, I think he was making a pretty good profit because I, I think what he was doing was buying straight off of Mt. Gox and then selling for, uh, you know, selling for a premium um, through PayPal, um, except, you know, PayPal didn't like it, so they shut it down. Um, you know, before even that happened, uh, there was, um, you know, WikiLeaks uh, and they they started accepting Bitcoin in large part because their PayPal account got shut down. So PayPal has like this integrated history with Bitcoin that goes pretty far back. And a lot of uh, people and organizations have turned to Bitcoin in part because PayPal shut them down. <laughs> Yeah, one of the conversations that comes up a lot um, is that I hear a lot of gold bugs on Twitter um, bashing Bitcoin for is like the government's ability to ban it. Uh, if that were to happen, what do you think the response would be and, and what would happen to the Bitcoin network? Well, the governments could ban it. Um, first, you, it, it depends on what kind of ban they, are, uh, they mean, right? Like uh, it could be um, any transmission, like what, what does a ban mean? Uh, you're not allowed to run your full node. You're not allowed to transfer any Bitcoin. You're not allowed to own any Bitcoin. Like all of those things seem a little bit out there for me. Um, like they could ban it, of course, um, and they, they could try very hard, but it all comes down to sort of like the nitty gritty and what um, what they like actually enforce. So, for example, they could say, "Well, you're not allowed to use Bitcoin to pay for anything, except you know you 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 can still have it as savings." I'm not sure a law like that would actually affect anything, right? Like, you don't use gold to go pay for your coffee right now, um, and gold does fine. Uh, so, it would probably put it on par there. Um, there's also a lot of people in Congress uh, that that own Bitcoin already. So, um, you know, to uh, I, I, I'm not sure there's political will to be able to do it. Um, I, by the time that the U.S. government recognizes the power of the dollar hegemony and like the threat that Bitcoin uh, puts to it, I'm, I'm not sure they, they'd be able to overcome that. And I think it'll be a much easier sell to go towards a more uh, Bitcoin denominated uh, world than to try to like, you know, do something like ban Bitcoin. I mean, they, I mean, 
they could say, hey, you're not allowed to own any Bitcoin or you have to turn it in uh, to the government for this amount of money or something like that. Um, I don't know how well that would go over. Uh, the reason why Executive Order 6102 back in 1933 worked with Franklin FDR is because FDR knew that most of the gold was held in banks and could just go over to the banks and say, give me all your gold. Uh, like that's not the case with Bitcoin. I mean, they can certainly go over to Kraken or Coinbase and say, give us all your Bitcoin. But I mean, that's, that's a small fraction of all the Bitcoin that exists. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, I'm not sure how it would work. And until I see uh, a particular proposal, it's hard for me to speculate on exactly what would happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, I, I had Pierre Richard on and I posed a similar question to him. And that's one thing that he pointed to is that the government, people in the government and the regulators are going to be either forced into owning it or already do, and it's going to impact their decisions. And I think that's really encouraging. Um, so Bitcoin really changes the relationship um, between people and governments. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, could you talk a little bit about how that happens with Bitcoin? Yeah. Uh, so currently, um, you know, we're kind of slaves of the government uh, because they can print money whenever they want. And whenever, uh, whenever they print money, uh, essentially what they're doing is diluting everyone else's savings. And that savings is something that you work for. That's, uh, you know, you put your uh, energy and time and effort into getting that money, getting that savings, and it gets diluted every time they print. So essentially, they're able to steal your labor. And they're able to steal your labor. Well, what, what, what's that called? That's, that's really just kind of a, a form of slavery, uh, you know, slightly more mild than uh, I guess what we traditionally think of it. But that's, that's essentially what it is. And, uh, and it's most obvious whenever the governments are spending like crazy. And that tends to happen during war. So uh, World War I, World War II, those are times of significant inflation. And that's largely because governments uh, want to run the war, and it used to be before uh, that uh, they would have to go and borrow that money, right? Like uh, in order to pay soldiers for weapons and things like that, they would have to go borrow the money. If they didn't have any in their vaults, they would have to go borrow the money. And of course, every war costs way more than anyone thinks. So, you know, a government would do that. Um, and uh, but and they would find that the interest rates would be exorbitant or that no one would lend to them, in which case uh, they would lose. Right. <laughs> and that that's how it used to be. Uh, the thing that changed with fiat money uh, and uh, especially uh, starting in the 20th century is that everybody uh, was able to just keep printing money. And what printing money does in that case is it subjugates the entire nation, everyone that uses that currency to the government. And that's exactly what happened in World War I and World War II, is that all, pretty much every country that was involved was able to go into what they call total war. And total war is different than limited war in the sense that limited war is uh, only some soldiers, you know, the military, they're, they're the ones fighting. Total war is everybody's fighting, everybody in, uh, and all of the resources of an entire economy are devoted towards war. Um, and that's, uh, that can only happen if you enslave the population to do it, which is essentially uh, what, uh, what these governments did. So I would say that, uh, you know, right now our relationship with the government um, is that of slavery because they have control of the money. They are able to print money and they are able to steal your wealth and labor. Um, and as a result, uh, you know, it, we, we have this weird relationship where we vote in our leader, vote, vote in people that are allowed to steal from us. It's, it's just kind of a really weird dynamic, but it's, okay, do you want these guys stealing from you or do you want these other guys stealing from you? That, that's essentially what we're voting on. Uh, what Bitcoin does is it takes that power of money printing away from the state. And that means that they can't just go steal your labor. They can still steal through uh, taxes somewhat, but taxes tend to be very, very difficult to raise. Um, ask any politician. It, it doesn't matter how blue a state that you're in. 
um, tax, tax uh, you know, raises and taxes are unpopular everywhere. It's, it's just nobody likes it, which is why inflation has been used uh, in so many places as a, as a substitute. Uh, but because of that, um, when, you, when you have Bitcoin, they have to explicitly tax you whenever they need revenue and they can't deficit spend anymore. They can't, there's no lender of last resort lending them money uh, whenever they uh, they overshoot their budget, so governments shrink, um, and as they shrink, uh, you know, it they they can't just sort of like commandeer uh, people's savings and their effort and their wealth and and stuff like that. So, um, in a sense, the government uh, like our votes actually start to matter again. It's uh, there. It's not about who gets to steal from us. It's who serves us and our interests, and that. Uh, that's a very good thing, and I uh, and you know that hopefully is the direction that we go towards as Bitcoin gains more prominence. Yeah, yeah. I had a uh, Jan Pritzker on, uh, and one of the things he talked about was uh, how money is political speech, and if you don't have money, you don't really have political speech. And in this case, you know, uh, when the government's stealing your money, like you're talking about, they're also like taking your ability to like voice anything. And so uh, one of the topics you, you brought up, which is uh, I think a really good one is uh, war. And um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I love to like try and orange pill my mom. Um, mm. it's, it's, it's a hobby of mine. And uh, I, I rarely like get through to her, um, which is fine. Um, but it's just, kind of entertaining to me but um we were walking through the air and space museum in tucson and there's a lot of military aircraft and we were just like reading like stats of like how many people died in these wars whether it was vietnam world war ii world war one and i explained to her if if a government can't print money they can't fund the wars in the same way and there's a lot less death as a result um uh and I thought, and, and that really made her think, you know, and I was arguing for like, you know, using gold as a money in that specific instance. But um, uh, there's a lot of energy going into um, politics um, from a lot of different people, uh, especially on the left of like this idea that we need to stop fighting these endless wars um, all over. And uh, I don't think it's possible until Bitcoin is like the the number one money that people are using because as long as the printing presses are there, they can just do these things with impunity um, to a certain regard. Like regard like what you were talking about as far as uh, um, being able to like have a secret tax on people to fund it. Um, so what I don't know what what are your thoughts on that? Like what. Mm -hmm. How, how would the landscape change from a geopolitical stance, like with Bitcoin being the dominant money? Yeah, uh, the, the power of money printing is really a power that no one should have, right? Like, um, it's like, um, I liken it to like the Infinity Gauntlet, you know, you, you know that from like the Marvel comic series. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. I get it. like, you know, it's, it's like this godlike power that, uh, that one superhero and like the whole point of the infinity gauntlet is to make sure that it can never be reassembled or whatever. Um, money printing is a lot like that. Whenever you have that power there available, uh, you know, everyone's going to fight for it. And that's, uh, that's essentially what politics has devolved into is everyone fighting for the infinity gauntlet of being able to print money. And and that that becomes like more bickering. It's it's really the ability to steal uh, labor and resources from other people, which, which is what that power is. What Bitcoin does is it neuters the infinity gauntlet of money printing. It it, it literally takes it away. It's it, it um, it's no longer available for people. Now, what does that do societally? There there's a bunch of things that I think it does, but I think the most important one. Uh, that I, I, I think will happen is that you get smaller states. Um, and the reason for that is that a lot of the countries in the world, uh, this is, uh, you know, like, you know, certainly the US, Russia, China, EU, um, a lot of that 
is, you know, the common currency or the ability to trade is a large part of why these countries are so big and why they continue to be big. Uh, because if you say split the U.S. down the middle or something like that, then you know you the the ability to trade in between um, the, or the inability thereof, because each government's going to uh, want the power of money printing, is what prevents it from sort of having smaller states. Um, what you get when you have Bitcoin is that sort of standard way to trade. And that means that instead of currency fluctuations and monetary policy and all, the, all this other stuff that go into uh, the centralizing force that we've had for the last hundred years or so, uh, it, it, it goes away. And that means that you get smaller states. And if you have smaller states, what happens? Uh, well, you know, these jurisdictions now have to compete with each other for citizens, for productive citizens. And they have to uh, figure, uh, and you know, like if you're, if you're not a very good citizen, if you, if you do evil things or whatever, um, then you're not going to be as wanted by these. Uh, there, there's a whole dynamic that comes along as a result of this, which is that you get, uh, you get more competition, you get better, better uh, laws and jurisdictions and more freedoms for people, more choices for people. Um, and that's a very good thing. Like, uh, like imagine if Tesla had, I mean, Tesla already sort of did, does this today is they sort of pit states against each other and take the best value or whatever. Uh, but imagine if instead of 50 states, there were a thousand. Um, there, there's a lot more that can be done uh, to, you know, try to win um, the productive people over to wherever you are. And um, that in turn will, you know, make for, you know, more interesting, more creative governance, uh, more interesting, more creative things being produced and so on. Yeah, I mean, the idea of uh, smaller states, I, I see you wrote a article on it and love the picture of the fat government on the couch. Um, that's one of the probably the most interesting ideas of Bitcoin is or the idea of like a universal currency is the way that it impacts trade because it's really complicated. Like you're talking about like borders are very restrictive. Um, it's it's hard to transact in and out of different currencies, whereas Bitcoin used universally is a lot easier and more efficient. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, it seems like these, like we're moving more, um, well, there, it, do you think there's gonna be a big fight that, that comes up where central authorities try and like stop the, the decentralization? Yeah, I, at some point, somebody's going to try something. Um, the, the question is, how will the decentralized network react? I mean, um, depends, I guess, on the, on the people that hold it and what they do. And that's, that's, uh, that's a hard question to answer. Um, I, I, I have a good idea of what I would do. If, uh, if they're going to throw me in prison for something, nothing is worth my freedom. <laughs> I would rather have my freedom uh, than whatever. Um, but there are other people where that's not the case, uh, uh, where they'll go and you know, defy whatever government orders they feel are unjust and so on. So I don't know. It, it's, it's a hard... A uh, hard thing to look at and uh, a hard thing to figure out exactly what that would be like. Um, and, and, you know, like, they'll, they'll, again, like uh, I answered before, um, you know, it depends on exactly what the nature of those things are, um, who's in power. And these are all like kind of unknowable at this point. Like, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, what if X, and we don't know the details of X, so that, that makes all the difference. Well, I think um, I'd like to bring some Keynesian ideas into the conversation, see what you think. Um, uh, so one of the biggest arguments for central banking is the idea of a, there needing to be uh, somebody to intervene when there's market failures. Uh, 
what what are your thoughts on that well the, uh, you have to ask yourself why is the market failing <laughs> like, what, what does market failure mean uh to to a large degree most market failures are the direct result of central bank policy so usually there's uh some sort of stimulus given to the economy and uh, people build things that uh, society actually doesn't want. It, it's just artificially uh, created. And then they collapse because there is no actual demand there. And uh, they should collapse for that reason. It's, uh, it's not something people want. And the resources that they're using to produce whatever goods they are should be freed up to do other things in the economy. Um, you know, sort of government intervention or central banking intervention is sort of... Um, uh, you know, prolonging that inevitable death. Uh, this is why we have so many zombie companies in the economy. These are companies that aren't contributing very much, uh, that are building products that people don't really want. Um, a, a lot of the resources that they have, including land and equipment and even human capital, uh, could be much better used elsewhere in the economy, uh, you know, where people actually have demand for uh, goods and services and so on. And that this is the creative destruction uh, of any economy is that, you know, things that are no longer in demand should die. Things that are in demand should grow. Like it, that, that's, that's how, you know, economics works. Uh, whenever the central bank intervenes, whenever the government intervenes and tries to quote unquote rescue these uh, industries or whatever, you almost always get inefficiency. You, you get uh, overproduction of things that nobody wants. Um, steep discounts on things, uh, overproduced things as a result. And, uh, you know, it, it gets essentially bailed out by taxpayers. Um, so they're stealing from us to go support some industry uh, that, uh, that is in favor with the government, which is uh, another form of cronyism. I, I, I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that's good. I, I think it's immoral and everything else. Why do you think there's so many people that uh, subscribe to the thought that these things are so necessary, these institutions are so necessary? Mm. Yeah, the, the reason why people like that stuff is because in the short term, you don't have to feel too much pain. Um, the thing about any sort of uh, business collapse or whatever is that you, you have to go through a period of pain before you can get back out on the other side stronger and so on. Um, and people don't like short term pain and uh, they'd rather delay it until tomorrow. It, it's high time preference behavior, which is, uh, you know, unfortunately been instilled in a lot of people over the past hundred years or so. Um, uh, you know, if you were looking out for the long term, uh, if you had low time preference, you would make very different decisions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, high time preference behavior seems endemic to our democracy. So it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting, uh, time preference is huge and, and most people don't really understand what time preference is. So one of the tweets that I have pulled up from you is, uh, you know, Bitcoin transitions a debt based economy to a savings based economy. And, uh, I think, a lot of times, like when these arguments are presented, they seem really counterintuitive to people, especially like uh, when things are as crazy as they are right now, because it almost feels like there's no point but for there to be government stimulus and money printing and stuff like that. But what is oftentimes absent from the conversation is the long history of poor monetary policy that created these issues. Um, why, why is it so important for people to be able to save instead of just endlessly borrowing and for governments? Well, um, the thing about debt is that it makes you way more fragile as, uh, as many people in this lockout are figuring out. Uh, the more you get into debt, you're essentially leveraging yourself and everything has to kind of go right. You're, uh, you're more volatile, you're, you're more fragile to shocks, any sort of like crazy thing that happens and your business is done. And this, this is the case for a lot of small businesses throughout the world is that they were leveraged too much. They depended on everything going right in order for things uh, to, uh, for them to survive and thrive and whatever. Um, and that, that's not a good thing. If you're, if you're fragile, you're, you're going to die out and 
there are systemic shocks every once in a while and you know that it calls the weak essentially that is a sign of weakness it's a it's a way in which um you know you you don't have control over you know what's uh, your own destiny, if you will. Um, building off of savings is much more practical and it's a lot less fragile. You're, you're able to build a business that's based on savings that you already have. So even if there is a systemic shock, you, you're not over leveraged, so you don't automatically crumble, which uh, you know, tends to happen. Um, the, the big thing about debt-based economies is that they're really borrowing from the future, right? Like they're, they're taking the productivity of the future and sort of pulling it forward to now. Um, that's a very bad idea because essentially you're saddling the future with the debt that you have and it's, it's hoped for that they'll be able to pay it off. Um, and that, that's really essentially high time preference behavior. Savings is a very low time preference behavior. It means that you have to really, you know, plan in advance what, what, what's going to happen uh, and, you know, not indulge in whatever uh, wants that you might have at the moment and instead uh, focus on savings. Uh, that's a very good thing for society when you plan for the long term. Uh, this, that's essentially how Rome gets built. It's, it's not through you know, short-term stimulus packages of lots and lots of debt, um, that doesn't work. You'll, you'll collapse in a generation very easily because if you do that. But, uh, but, you know, building things out from savings, that, that's, that takes real work. Uh, and that, that's how civilization gets built and stays built. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of uh, another tweet you have is uh, the borrower is servant to the lender. Uh, when property rights are eroded by the government, we become more a servant to the government. And um, um, so two questions out of that. So it, how does government debt impact? Uh, well, I'll, I'll use an example. So like the city of Chicago is a terribly run city and, um, it's just abysmal. And, uh, you know, they city or all these states and all these cities have budget balanced budget requirements built into their constitutions. And so the way that they get out of um, that and are able to deficit spend is they borrow money and count it as revenue, um, which is pretty crazy, you know, if you think about it. So how, do, how does that, uh, like government borrowing in that manner uh, kind of erode the democracy. Yeah, they're, they're essentially, um, you know, using accounting tricks in order to, uh, you know, balance their budget or to, you know, fulfill the letter of the law, but not the spirit of it. Um, but the spirit of the law is there for a reason. And it's, it's there so that you don't spend, uh, you know, future revenue that you're supposed to get. Um, unfortunately, uh, governments, uh, you know, city and state governments are so uh, intent on deficit spending that they do stuff like that. They, uh, they use accounting tricks they, uh, in order to spend more than they have and, uh, and so on. Um, the resulting uh, thing is that you get a lot more people that are essentially paying off the excesses of their masters. Um, and you know, the, it's, it's kind of a sad commentary on civilization that so many people do that. Uh, but yeah, it, it, we're, we're servant to the government as a result of their ability to do fiscal shenanigans and accounting tricks like that. And second, second part of the question, um, so how does how is the government we, we talked a little bit about like inflation impacting mm -hmm. people's wealth and stealing from them and taxes how how is the government uh eroding property rights and why are property rights so important yeah so currently we don't really have property rights uh like you know land is considered a property right but we don't we don't really have it because if you don't pay your property taxes they'll take it away from you so <laughs> In a sense, uh, you're, you're renting your property from the government and they 
quote unquote give you a title, but it's not it's not really yours. It's uh, it's yours at their permission, which is not really property rights. And th it, this is the same for almost any asset that you couldn't think of, um, especially those that are not bare instruments. So, um, you know, you may think you have some stock, but if a judge says, no, you don't, then you don't own the stock. That's how it is. Um, now, they're very careful to hide this fact and to, uh, you know, make it very difficult uh, for, say, a judge to do something like that. But nevertheless, we don't really have strong property rights. Uh, and that, that's a fact all through the world. Uh, I mean, Executive Order 6102 in particular was particularly egregious because they said, well, you own this gold, we're going to take it away. We're going to take it away, and um, and that and they managed to do so. That which is uh, especially concerning. Um, but that having strong property rights is a an important part of civilization because it gives us the motivation to actually do you know, work and create and do do all sorts of things. And that's how capitalism is supposed to work. But when you erode property rights with uh, mostly laws of some kind or another. Um, you erode people's motivation to go and do something. Profit motive is very, very powerful. And it, it's what causes us to go out and work and do things and take action. Um, if you remove that, then, you know, action becomes a lot more politicized. And, uh, you know, I mean, you can study the Soviet Union to see what a society that's based on, uh, you know, almost purely political considerations looks like. And, it's uh, it's not something that you want, believe me. Uh, uh, you can you can study the accounts of uh, what people went through uh, in you know communist uh, countries to really know, but that that that's what it's like. So um, you know, property rights are a fundamental human right, and if if you don't have property rights, then you're even more of a servant to the government, um, and that's the, this is why. Uh, you know, it's important. It's so that you you're, you have self sovereignty and uh, you're not a slave. Yeah, yeah, that's. Well, there's this like weird trend that's happening where they're called uh, tankies, uh, people that really like defend communism and say things like Mao wasn't that bad or or Stalin wasn't that bad. Um, why, why do you think there's people moving in that direction and believing that? I don't know. I, I, to some degree, like a lot of political belief is probably based on personality. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff from Jordan Peterson that uh, on that, like if you're more compassionate, you want to believe uh, more in socialism, for example. Um, and I don't know, uh, they, they probably haven't read the history, uh, you know, cultural revolution or, you know, what, uh, you know, the gulags in Russia and things like that. Like they, they probably just don't know about it or refuse to understand what, what all that was like or, you know, listen to the testimonies of the people that grew up during all of that. I mean, like every time I talk to somebody that grew up in, uh, communist uh russia you know I, I i i'm like wow i can't believe that was how it was i mean they they made such crazy claims about you know what they were doing just like okay like we're going to scientifically determine where we should put our resources and what we should study and what we should try like that's not a question science can answer like where to put money or you know how how to figure out where you know the next innovation is going to come and stuff so like it, it's just absolutely mind-boggling what some of these uh these governments are forced to believe um also like part of it is i uh, you know ideological a lot of people have problems admitting that they were wrong about anything um and that's uh made worse by sort of like the social media kind of thing that's going on. I mean, you can even see it during this election. There, there's like about half the country that will, uh, you know, close their ears and say, la, 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 whatever the other side makes, uh, you know, 
any accusation of any kind, whether legitimate or illegitimate, it's just, I'm not going to listen to you. I, I don't need to, or I don't want to, or something like that. There's no real respect for truth. So when they say something like Mao wasn't that bad, Stalin wasn't that bad, I suspect what they're really saying is, I want to believe that they aren't bad. And there's this sense that they, uh, a lot of these people think that they can create their own reality um, and they haven't been slapped upside the head by reality yet in anything. You know, they, they've been coddled through a high school or, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, college. And then they think, okay, well, uh, it's, uh, you know, reality is whatever I say it is. And, uh, you know, if I want to say that Mao wasn't bad, then that's just the truth. It, it's a very sort of like, uh, I make my own truth type of philosophy, uh, which unfortunately is being coddled in the education system today. And I, you know, like, as you get older, you tend to recognize that, okay, well, you can't do that for long without going crazy or manic depressive, becoming a manic depressive or something like that. So I suspect that a lot of these people will um, grow out of it, if you will. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It is, uh, yeah, the polarization that we're seeing in society is really crazy. And that's one of the things that, like, I love uh, um, podcasts because you get to sit down and, like, have a discussion with people and, and bounce ideas. I mean, I found it to be one of the best uh, um, forums just for learning in general um, because you get access to some of the most intelligent people out there that have long discussions and it's not just like a quick sound bite. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so what, what you've dedicated your life to or a large portion of your life to Bitcoin. Um, what would have to happen for you to say that you were wrong? <laughs> uh, I, I guess if Bitcoin goes back down to like, 50 bucks or something, then yeah, I, I would say I'm wrong. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the number is a pretty good indicator of uh, where popular sentiment is. I mean, it can get, re, uh, you know, manipulated and so on, but I am not under no delusions about that. But it's over a long period of time, I think it's generally a pretty good indicator of where sentiment is and how much people have adopted it and you know the the nice thing is there is an objective truth here and it's reflected in that number um and you know we were talking earlier about how there's a lot of people that wish that they can or that refuse to believe that there is a truth and think that they can make up their own um i i, I think one of the things that that's nice about Bitcoin is that there, there is an objective truth here and it's, it's clearly reflected. And when, when you have that, um, it's kind of undeniable and, uh, you know, sort of philosophically speaking, it gives you, um, you know, a basis to start questioning other things. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard of many Bitcoiners starting to question things other than money as a result of, mm -hmm getting into Bitcoin. Uh, and that's normal because, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's an admission that there is a, uh, an underlying reality that we have to pay attention to. And that's, uh, and, you know, discovering more of it is actually intellectually thrilling and interesting and makes life <laughs> worth living. Whereas trying to create your own reality and, you know, uh, sort of living a Nietzschean will to power existence is, not very satisfying at all. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it brings you to a point of madness in many ways. Yeah, it, it's just exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting to live like that, um, to have your brain just melting constantly. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, we're, I, we're seeing the impacts of that in society as people are just like losing their minds um, over little things. And, um but yeah um so okay do you uh things are just like insane 2020 has been a year that's just like flipped everything on its head do you do you have faith in in humanity in the future <laughs> and and if so why 
Um, I, I wouldn't say I have faith in humanity. I have faith in God. You know, like that's something that I believe in. Uh, like humanity um, can be very evil. And we know this uh, with numerous historical examples and so on. Um, there is almost no end to the depravity of human beings. And that's, uh, you know, and I include myself among them. I, I know how uh, envious I can be, uh, how hateful I can be. Um, th this is why I need fight, faith in a higher power. Um, do I, like, do I have hope out of this thing? Um, if, if I didn't believe in God and if I didn't have Bitcoin, I would, I would struggle with that question. I would be like, oh my goodness, uh, things are going to hell in a handbasket and I, I, I really have nothing else to look forward to. But because I believe in God, because uh, you know, there is something of a hope in Bitcoin because it, it, it's a way to opt out of the system and a, um, you know, we could kind of see light at the end of the tunnel because this thing exists, which can take away state power and this sort of almost Orwellian existence that we're living under currently. Um, that gives me hope. And that, that means that there, there is something that can be done and there is something that we can work towards and there is something uh, that's better than what it is now. And uh, instead of being slaves to uh, the government or to our media culture, corporate masters, or I, I don't know, I think they call it the cathedral or something like that. Um, you know, we, we have something else and I can be more self-sovereign and I can work towards, uh, you know, making civilization better and, uh, you know, waking people up and red pilling them about, you know, what the real world is like, that it exists, number one, that there is truth and, and that it's, uh, you know, it may not be to your ideal, but it's a lot better than, uh, you know, a world without it. <laughs> if that makes sense yeah yeah no i appreciate that answer definitely um i victor frankel is one of my favorite um writers and he wrote man's search for meaning which i read periodically i've probably read it like six times um and it's one of the things that he talks about is like the ability to have purpose will help you to overcome chaos and pain and he uses the um his own personal story of surviving the Holocaust, which is one of the darkest points in human history, um, as an example, um, and it's pretty powerful. Uh, so, yeah. Um, oh. Yeah, and that, that's for me uh, an encouragement because, um, you know, I, I don't know if you've read Solzhen uh, he, he was He was like a survivor of the Gulag and the the Soviet Union, and he, he just talks about his experience of, uh, you know, what he went through and everything else. And uh, some of the stuff in there is absolutely mind blowing because it's not, it's not what you would think. Uh, you would think, okay, like you go to this place that's uh, where you're essentially slave labor in completely inhumane conditions, uh, and you're given very little food and you have to constantly work and, uh, you know, they can shoot you at any time and all this other stuff. Um, but he's talking in the book about how refreshing it was and how much he understood more about himself and everything else. Um, and part of it is what you were describing, which is he had a purpose, which was to survive and to get out and to uh, you know, not let it beat him or, uh, or something like that. Uh, but a part of it was that he, he recognized that we, even within the confines of something so restrictive as a gulag, there is something, uh, you know, that they can't capture and it, it, it's, it's inside of him. And so like, apparently while he was in the gulag for something like 15 years or something like that, uh, he wrote like a lot and he, he memorized, uh, he, he wrote like, for example, like entire really long poems and stuff like that. He memorized it. He was able to, like, he said, like one of my joy, most joyous times was like, you know, working in the fields in some inhumane uh, scenario and just going over the verses of the poetry that he had written 
um, in his mind over and over again. And like, uh, and he was, he was saying like, and the camaraderie that you feel with those people that are there, it's, it, it, it was just so uh, enriching. And like, these are like friends that he'll have for life. And I wonder sometimes, right? Like, you, you think about the friends that you had, I, I will bet you anything, it's not at the level that he had. And it, it's in part because of that shared suffering, that shared experience, yeah. that, that, uh, that like striving together for some purpose. Um, and that's, I, I think ultimately, like what, what has to kind of give us hope here in, in, in these kind of dark times of, lockdown and so on. I mean, we can have, we, it's kind of a weird time because, you know, people have all the entertainment that they want, but it's not that meaningful. <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. something that they're recognizing is there, a lot of my friends are completely depressed because they don't have anything to look forward to. But if you have something to look forward to, having purpose, um, it changes everything. It, it, it really does. And that's, uh, that's, I think, hopefully something that we can get out of this is for a lot of people to recognize that you need to have purpose, you need to have a hope, you need to have something that you're striving towards. Otherwise, you're going to shrivel up and die. Um, and that's something that he describes as well in, in the gulags is that the first people to die, they're the ones that either hoped in the wrong thing <laughs> or just, uh, you know, kind of gave up. Um, and th those are the first people to die, whereas, you know, people like him survive. Yeah, yeah, Victor Frankl t said the same thing in his book, and yeah, um, a lot of people, I, I think what's hard for a lot of people to find a sense of purpose and meaning is that there's so much uh, nonsense driven into us, like in schooling and stuff like that, and it's funny because, like, there's this idea of, like, oh, you can be whatever you want to be, you know, but there's also like a very like strong undertone, except if you go outside of these um, certain parameters, um, like, and uh, um, whatever, whatever it is, it's constantly changing, but um, uh, it is very, um, very, so, like financial health is something that I feel very passionate about um, because it, it, I feel like it gives a person dignity. Um, there's a term wage slavery that I like to throw around a lot because we have so many people living paycheck to paycheck. So not only are they, you know, slaves to their government, like you were talking earlier, but they're slaves to their employer, um, mm -hmm. dependent entirely on them for a paycheck to pay the bills on healthcare, you know, on, all of these different things and it's it's it i think it strips you of your like uh dignity in a lot of ways like it, mm -hmm. self sovereignty really um changes your perspective if you're financially healthy and your boss tells you to do something unethical you can tell him no you know mm -hmm. without the fear of like a major life crisis happening um and I feel like Bitcoin is one of the most powerful tools to achieve that. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. Um, uh, and I think that's, what's so great about being involved in Bitcoin is because we're working on making a better society and a better future ultimately. Um, whether, well, I mean, there's a lot of people in it that are just for the financial gains, but <laughs> for the Lambos or whatever, but uh uh, I, I personally like kind of reflecting on what you were talking about is like, if you didn't have God, if you didn't have Bitcoin, you'd feel pretty hopeless. And, you know, I feel similar because I feel like I'm doing something tangible to better mm -hmm. my community um, where, you know, so many, so many people are going to be showing up to the voting booth, just feeling discouraged because they're like, what difference am I really making in this action? Um, and, you know, I, I honestly, they, they, they probably aren't. I, there's a reason I don't vote, right? Like, uh, I don't. I, I. I don't think it makes a difference. The, there. There's yeah. so many people cheating. I. I, I think there's a video that came out today uh, about, you know, somebody able to change like nine thousand votes. It's a. It's. We don't like. First of all, your your vote doesn't matter that much. Um, and you know, even even if you do vote and uh, you get what you want, it's 
it's not necessarily what you actually want. You're voting for a person uh, and they're, they're, they're the people that get to do whatever they want and not really you. It's a representative democracy. Um, and, and third, like after you vote and they, they do whatever, like there's no real punishment me mechanism other than voting them out of office. It's, it's, and it's not that bad. Uh, I mean, like most of these congressmen and congresswomen, I guess, they, they, uh, they're able to come out, get like these cushy gigs or whatever. I'm hearing though that like most people that run for Congress actually have a lot of money and like people like AOC are the exception. Like they're most, most people have already, they need like a ton of money in order to run because of all the media buys that they need to have and, and uh, all the connections that they need to create in order to do that first. But regardless of all of that, um, you know, the, the problem that you pointed out earlier is that a lot of people are wage slaves. A lot of people feel purposeless. Uh, a lot of people uh, don't, um, I don't know, like they, they're, they don't have uh, their humanity or their dignity. And a large part of that, I think, is because they traded in their freedom for safety. And that's, that's the sad reality uh, today, which is that, you know, you, you can go work for an employer, you will get a pretty consistent paycheck, right? Like that's, uh, especially if you work in a salaried uh, position, you get a pretty consistent paycheck with maybe a bonus at the end of the year, something like that. Uh, but you give up a lot when you do that. You're not allowed to work anywhere else, uh, at least usually. Uh, maybe you could do a side gig or something like that, but generally those, uh, those take too much time or too, too long to develop or whatever. Uh, you can't really contract for other places. So by, by doing that, you, you get this consistent paycheck, but you're also giving up a lot in opportunity costs in terms of freedom, in terms of you know, ability to develop your other skills and, and get other things. But most people are very happy to take that, bar, uh, that sort of Faustian bargain. Uh, they're, they're willing to go and um, you know, trade in uh, freedom for, for safety. Uh, and th this is in lots of other areas of life too. Like they're, they're willing to, um, you know, vote for somebody that might take away their civil liberties, but promises to keep them safe or whatever. Um, but that, that's a bad trade. Uh, part of, uh, you know, being human is that you need that room to create. And if you, if you have too much safety, you don't have room to create or to, uh, you know, contribute. Uh, and sadly, like the, the instinct of many people is towards safety. Uh, I mean, like some level of safety is pretty necessary, but like if, you, if you're a reasonably healthy person, um, are you really like holding on to that job because of healthcare, right? Like you, like that's a justification for, you know, like wanting safety not necessarily that that's what you actually value. It's, it's, it's sort of like a rationalization to continue doing whatever you're doing. Uh, it would be much better if we had like an economy of smaller entrepreneurs where like, you know, you, you had, you know, 10 different customers. And if one tells you that they want something unreasonable, you can just sort of tell them, sorry, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And then, uh, and then you, you still have nine customers that, that's how it was for a really long time. If you're a candle maker, you have a customer that doesn't like your candles, they go somewhere else. And that's okay. If you piss off too many customers, then you start getting in trouble. But there, th that was the whole market process. Instead, now you have, uh, you know, one employer that sort of controls, uh, you know, your entire destiny. And that's the situation that most people around the world find themselves in. And that's, completely unnatural. That's uh, very fragile. And that's, uh, you know, they might have safety, but it's a very fragile safety. And when it, when it collapses, it collapses catastrophically. And that's mm -hmm. not, a, not a system that you want to be a part of. And, you know, I, this is something that I would encourage pretty much anyone that's, uh, that's out there, uh, especially people that are younger, start your own business that that will teach you more about life and will make you more anti-fragile than anything else. Right? Like you, you go work for a company, you do X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, like it, it, it puts you into a safety mindset. It puts you into, uh, 
you know, like not caring that much about your freedom and like willing to rationalize almost anything to keep that safety. Whereas if you're out on your own doing your own thing, um, it changes your perspective significantly. It, it, it makes you more willing to try things and understand what the trade-offs are instead of just taking this one deal uh, and then like coasting on it for the rest of your life. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Um, where are some good places that people can follow your work? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Jimmy song. I have a YouTube channel off chain with Jimmy song. I have a podcast, uh, Bitcoin fixes this. It's on anchor. Um, I, uh, I'm on, there's uh, some other stuff that I'm on, but I can't remember. So I'll stop there. Yeah. And if, uh, you know, for anybody following, um, or sorry, listening, um, it, you have a lot of, uh, because you're such a, um, influential person in Bitcoin, you have a lot of people trying to scam and copy you. So if you get somebody named, uh, Jimmy song, that's the username is a little bit off and has an underscore or something like that. And is trying to show you altcoins. Know that that's not Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I have a PGP key in there for a reason. If you mm. ever get emailed by those people, just ask for a signed message. I, I, I provide them whenever people ask me. So um, yeah, that, that, that's how you're supposed to verify that this is cryptography at work. Unfortunately, most people don't know about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time and thanks for coming on, Jimmy. Yeah, well, welcome. Thanks for having me. That was a really fun interview, and if you had never heard Jimmy before, now you know why he's such a uh, important person in the space of Bitcoin because he's just really smart um, and well-rounded in his beliefs. And it was nice to end on kind of a hopeful outlook on things because uh, we all need a little bit of encouragement during times like this. Um, but yeah, uh, if you want to get involved with what i'm trying to do uh reach out to me on twitter i love to talk with people talk bitcoin um do meetups via zoom to talk bitcoin whatever um yeah just reach out to me love dms i got both of mine open unless you're trying to shill me sh shit coins and then i don't really love it but I'll, I'll still respond and have a conversation with you um but yeah, if you want to support me, I do have a Patreon, uh, Tucson Blockchain, and uh, yeah, I love it. But the best way to support the podcast, if you like the content I'm making, is to you know just do all the typical stuff that everybody tells you to do: like, subscribe, leave reviews. You know, if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, it goes a long way to. Uh, boosting the, the uh, algorithms to get me out to more people. Thanks for listening.